Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for my talk with Steve Gutenberg. Um, I am delighted to be here. I'm Regina Weinreich, in case you haven't met me before. And um, Steve, as we know, is a, a great actor. He's also done some producing, directing, writing uh, theater, in theater and in film. And uh, he's also known for his philanthropy. So I hope to speak about all those things uh, in my conversation with him. So let's welcome him, Steve Gutenberg. Somebody? Yeah, yeah there you go. That felt great. <laughs> Hello? Well, um, I left out one, one uh, point uh, from my little summation of your career. You're also like this incredible dancer, which I discovered in watching Diner again. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, Jews are not known as dancers. <laughs> you know, when you want to get a dancer, you know, you're going to get an Italian, you know, you're going to get a Spanish guy. But when you want to get some plastic surgery, <laughs> this is where you want to go. When you want to get your taxes done, this is where you want to go. Um, I was on a, a, a terrible experience called um, Dancing with the Stars. Um, I was, uh, well, you look, you know what's so funny? You look just very much like my grandma. Yeah, it's a, you know, and my grandma, yeah, my, yeah and she's a beautiful lady. Um, anyway, um, anyway, I, um, I did some dancing in a couple of films I've done, but um, uh, I was uh, on that uh, crazy show. My, actually, I wasn't working at the time. I was uh, having a hard time getting some work, and my manager said, hey, you know, this Dancing with the Stars, you make some money and great exposure. That's actually, <laughs> you got to remember as an actor, when anyone ever tells you great exposure, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Whatever they say, it's great exposure. Or like, it's like sort of saying, uh, I, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a comfortable house. Something, something's wrong there. So, anyway. I, I know how you feel about Dancing with the Stars. I was invited to be... Um, Jeff Goldblum's partner, oh, and yes. as you know, he's about three times my height. Yes. So I think it was a joke. Yes. You know, I'm always people come up to me in the airport and they say Jeff Goldblum, and I go, <laughs> it's just, like not all Jews are the same actor. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just like oh, Jewish actor it must be Goldblum. So. Well, um, speaking of being Jewish, um, that's my segue to Brooklyn. Uh, okay. Tell me about being born in Brooklyn. Born in Brooklyn, and then um, your migration to Hollywood. Oh, okay, great. That's a that's a broad spectrum, but uh, Brooklyn to Hollywood. Well, I was um, yeah, I was born in Borough Park, and then my parents moved to Flushing Queens, and then we moved to uh, Massapequa, Long Island. And I lived there till I was 17. And um, actually, my grandmother said to me, you know, I got the acting bug. So my parents were kind enough to let me uh, leave home at 17 and a half and go out to Hollywood, which in retrospect, I think about that and I, think, I say, wow, what an incredible piece of, of pain it must be to let your child leave your house and go out to those freakazoids out <laughs> on the West Coast where you don't know what's gonna go on. I mean, what your kid's gonna meet and how is he gonna get along and what's gonna happen to him. So I always, younger, when I was younger, I didn't really realize it, but as I get older now, I, 
I think, what a gift they gave me and what trust they had in me. So I came out there when I was 17 and a half, um, and I lived there uh, working till about 15 years ago when I moved back to New York City. Uh, my mom was uh, in going through some health issues, so I moved out back there, and, and we, Emily, my fiance, and I have been living there for 15 years, and now we uh, moved, just moved to the West Coast because my parents moved to the Phoenix area. Mm. So that's my little geography lesson of Gutenberg. Were they at all disappointed that you didn't want to become a neurosurgeon? Uh, they're, they're, complete, they're constantly disappointed in me. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, my parents are wonderful people. That's why I, we, we visit them all the time and with them all the time. They're really supportive, very brave people, and very deep, very soulful people. So. Okay, but there was nothing in Brooklyn or Massapequa that could have prepared you for the role that you played in Diner, okay? So did you go to acting school? What happened in there? Well, actually, I learned everything I need to know at li in life at my parents' kitchen table. So the truth is, I've learned everything I need to know in Massapequa and in Flushing and in Brooklyn, okay. actually. Uh -huh. um, I started out when I was uh, 12 years old joining a teen repertory theater, playing uh, Rapunzel and The Prince and uh, <laughs> you know, Jack and the Beanstalk and doing all that stuff in libraries. And um, then when I was 17, uh, no, when I was 16, I went into the city and I went to the Herbert Berghoff. Uh -huh. And I studied there. And then I studied a little bit uh, the Meisner uh, technique over at the neighborhood playhouse um, and then I audited over at the studio so as a teenager I'd go into the city all the time and see plays and have my training mm -hmm. um, which actually did prepare me for diner or roller coaster I had one line in this movie called roller coaster or boys <laughs> from Brazil or any of my early yeah, yeah. work I really was prepared and confident um, I was um, as all actors are when they begin, they're con men. We're confidence men. We try to bestow in the casting director, or the producer, the director, confidence. Hire me. Give me a shot. And then from a con man, you become uh, a professional. And you're highly skilled. And you're authentic. But at the beginning, you're trying to talk people into buying your shoes. Uh, and then you're going to be standing in those shoes. Well, okay, that might explain acting, but how do you go from uh, serious acting, as the prince in Rapunzel, uh, to the comedy that you do? Because I, I, I think you have a great, great comic flair. I, I laughed all the way through Diner. Oh, thanks. Well, I was very lucky to get in that movie. Um, my feeling about acting is twofold. Theater is one game where I could play a 90-year-old man on stage because those people up there might, yes, you, sir, um, <laughs> have a, 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 a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So the makeup will sell. Whereas on film and television, you're really, some, most of the time, restricted by the equipment that God gave you. Mm -hmm. Paul Newman used to say, I do the best job I can with the equipment I'm given. On stage, he could play somebody from any part of the world, but on camera, when the camera's this far away, it's pretty authentic. So the equipment I've been given is a round face, round eyes, round mouth, and those are more adaptable to comedy. But I was trained as a dramatic actor. Um, but the business of television and film is... I always like to think about it is it's acting, but it's not acting. You see, Lassie can be a movie star. <laughs> Lassie cannot be a theater star. It's just the uh, way it is. Right. The dog on Fraser can be a television star. The dog on Fraser cannot do Lear. <laughs> he just can't. So movies and television is a different ball game. So, and it's a, more of a business as opposed to theater where tonight or tomorrow night there'll be a wonderful mm -hmm. show here. And hopefully they'll break even or be able to subsidize the theater. 
Whereas if this was a television show or a film and you're just breaking even, you're not going to continue. So do you um, prefer to do theater or prefer films? Or I know you've done a lot of television. Uh, you've worked in every genre. Uh, do you have any preferences? I prefer to get paid. <laughs> yeah. Tony Bennett, when they ask him to do charitable <laughs> events, he says, I don't sing for free. And there's an illusion about an actor as he gets older that you just love the craft so much that you'll go anywhere and do that. <laughs> it's just not true. <laughs> right. I have a family to support and uh, I have responsibilities and gas bills and lighting bills and, <laughs> you know. You mean you're a regular guy? I'm, we're, we're all regular guys. <laughs> the illusion is we're something special. And that's why you pay money at the box office to see Clark Gable or Redford or George Clooney or Brad Pitt or Dwayne Johnson. Mm -hmm. The illusion is, is that we're superheroes, that Robert Downey really is Iron Man. But we're not. Mm -hmm. we're, we're craftsmen. We sit down at our table, at our workbench, and we tap out shoes or watches or characters. And we bring those characters to work, and we get a burrito and a cup of coffee in the morning, and <laughs> they're setting up the camera, and we put on our outfit, our work clothes, our uniform, and then we present this watch, this pair of shoes, this character to the audience. And we hope that everyone says, wow, this is an incredible Patek Philippe, we're going to buy it, or these are incredible Gucci shoes, which these are not. <laughs> uh, but, um, and everybody wants to buy them. But it's a craft. Like your job is a craft, or like any of your jobs are crafts. Mm. We're trained, we're highly skilled, and we try to give a, a good performance, which is our product. Um, and now the, then there's the magic involved, right. you know. Sometimes you're born looking like Brad Pitt, and it's not so tough. You know, you walk out, and you're like, hello, and then everybody's like, oh my God. You know, where then there are guys like me who have to rely a little bit more on who we are and what we can present. Um, I'm always uh, um, uh, thrilled to see great acting coming from somebody who is very ordinary looking. Mm -hmm. One of my favorites is um, Edward Everett Horton, who was a great character actor in the 40s. And one of, you know who he is? One of the yeah. great actors of all time. Nobody would know who he is, but he was really terrific at playing a character. And when you saw him in 1940 in a film, you're thrilled, because you know this guy has been working at his workbench on this character and he's going to present you a great product. So Peter Lorre was like that. Paul Giamatti is like that. Steve Buscemi mm. is like that. You know, you go on and on. These great actors who are ordinary looking, but they're at their workbench doing great work. Uh, so I'm always, I'm, I'm always thrilled to watch that kind of thing. Well, um, how And I like it? to be that. How does it change your life when you get to do a project like uh, Police Academy? Sure. Uh, well, that's the, the Gucci loafer that <laughs> and all of a sudden everybody wants. Right. It's the Tory Burch for you ladies. A few mm -hmm. years ago, that, that emblem, and everybody had to have right. those little flats with that emblem. Oh, wow, I'm part of that Tory Burch crew. Uh -huh. um, and uh, as I said, for an actor, Theater is different. You can do the most brilliant Lear that's ever been done. And you do it for 15 weeks at the Brooks Atkinson, and it's a smash hit. And uh, it closes, and then you're looking for your next job. Now, you might have a little easier job getting the next gig because you were great in Lear. But it's very, there's only a few Nathan Lanes in theater. Mm. There's only a few guys, Matthew Broderick, that you know are going to give you what you want on stage. You're going to buy a ticket for them. Bernadette Peters, uh, uh, Bette Midler. There's only a few okay. of those people. But in film and television, you're really relying on box office. As I said, Lassie, if her movie makes $30 million in one weekend, she is a movie star. And they want her for the next movie. So for me, 
I was very lucky early on. I was 21 or 20, I think I was 21, 22 when I was cast in Police Academy. Um, and that was a certain change in my life because I had, I was making the Tory Burch shoes that everybody wanted. <laughs> right. So for a while, that last, Gary Cooper said, for every hit you have, you get five bombs. <laughs> and that's sort of the rule. You know, you get to strike out five times. Do you so love them count. less? Sorry? Do you love your bombs less? No. I, they're all children to me, and I love them the same. <laughs> I love, they're all the same. I hate them the same and I love them the same. Because it takes as much energy to make a crappy movie as it does to take, make a good movie. You get up early, you get there, you eat burrito, you memorize your lines, you work at your workbench, you make your character, and you hope that it's a hit because then you're allowed to do it again, so. Well, we, we know that movies are a, a collaborative venture. And I wondered um, if there are any uh, directors that you worked with that you enjoyed working with more than others, or um, I'm going to say that right on stage in front of a camera. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, you, can't, well, you can't say that. Well, you, but you can say that you enjoyed working on uh, a particular I can movie say, with so and so. I love them all. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, but the truth is, I do. These are all guys who studied the script, were in pre-production for a year or six months, and looking for the right guy, and they cast me. Now, there were some guys and ladies that I liked less or enjoyed their company more, mm -hmm. but I do know that they all got up and went to work every day and did the best they could. Now, some of them made bombs for me, and some of them made hits. Um, I, I can say that do I like the guys who made the hits better than the ones who made the bombs? <laughs> well, Emily and I are able to go out to dinner because of the hits, you know? So I can say thank you to Hugh Wilson, mm -hmm. who made Police Academy, um, or I could say thank you to Leonard Nimoy, who made Three Men and a Baby, right. um, because that gave me the ability, if you know, Emily wants a Coca-Cola, I can go, let's go get a Coca-Cola. <laughs> Whereas, you know, if I didn't have those hits, and I, I was still an actor, you know, it's, you're struggling to make a living. There's 160,000 people in the Screen Actors AFTRA um, union. 10%, which is 16,000, make a living. They call that living $4,000. Mm. So 16,000 people out of 160,000 make more than 4,000, I mean, make $4,000. There's only a few Clooney's and Pitt's and Woody Harrelson's and Dwayne Johnson's that make millions. Most of the actors are struggling to pay the bills. So, you know, in a, in a long-winded way, I, I just, I, I'm the luckiest, one of the luckiest guys in the world to paint paintings and people bought them. I mean, I, I always say to myself, do you know how unbelievably difficult that is. I mean, the people who are on this stage, mm -hmm. I'm sure this is a theater stage, who do theater are brilliant. You ever go to the Guthrie in M Minneapolis? They're brilliant. Go to the Stratford-upon-Avon in, in, in Canada? Brilliant. Do you, does anybody know who Colin Fiore is? Colin Fiore, if you've seen him, you'll know who he is. He's one of the most brilliant Shakespearean actors who ever walked the earth. But he doesn't get paid very much when he does a film. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, Robert Guillaume was one of the greatest theater actors ever. But, you know, so there's a, as I said, Lassie might make more than him, you know, <laughs> doing a, a film. So right. long-windedly, I mean, this is my opportunity to talk. So, you know, <laughs> when I'm home, she's always saying, don't talk. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I just know how lucky I am to be sitting on the stage and you guys woke up, got showered, ate your breakfast, drove here to see me. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. There's two guys here, Ray and John, who said they drove 200 miles to come see me. Wow. Wait, those guys, well, there you are. There you, there you are. Thank you. I mean, I mean, 
incredible. It's just incredible to me. So uh, uh, I'm just, you know, I, I, and I take it all for granted all the time. You know, we wake up, we live in a beautiful home. We were living in Manhattan in a beautiful apartment. We just moved to West Coast to a beautiful home. As I said, if Emily wants Coca-Cola, we could buy a Coca-Cola. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, it's incredible to me. It really, especially moments like this when I'm talking, you know. Is it, is it much different when you do theater? Uh, I, I yeah, know you do yeah, it's a Prelude lot different. to a Kiss, yeah. for example. Prelude to a Kiss, what a great show. Yes, it's different because you, but you have to prove it every night. Yeah. Um, whereas in a movie, you really just only have to get it right once. I mean, you know, that day you woke up, you felt really great, you got a phone call from your best friend, you're driving in the car, there's no traffic, you're in a great mood. The scene is a really important scene. You know it, you get on there. They're all set up. The director says, action. You do it twice, he goes, great, move on. And that scene lasts forever. And everybody thinks you're the greatest actor in the world, and that one moment, whether it, the guys were talking about, Ray, uh, Doc and John were talking about the scene of Police Academy where, this is actually a brilliant scene where <laughs> G.W. Bailey <laughs> flies through the air and goes into a horse's patoot. <laughs> and he's stuck in the horse's ass and I yell, somebody call a veterinarian, <laughs> which is like a, you know, a brilliant line. And we shot it maybe twice. <laughs> and then we went to lunch. Now that, you know, that line is you know, killed in the, in the theater. So there's a difference. You gotta yeah. really bring it every night in the right. theater, which the great part is you get to work on it every night. You know? right. uh, Talk a little bit about your work on television. Uh, I know sure. you've done Ballers recently, and uh, I, I know there's a, a, a ton of stuff. Yeah. So how's that? Well, one of my favorite, one of my first experiences on television was a show called Family with um, um, Seda Thompson, who was the lead in that show, and actually, um, Mr. Broderick, I always call him Mr. Broderick, was Matthew Broderick's father, was okay. in the show too. And of course, Will Gear was, Will, no, no, Will Gear was not in that show. Um, but Seda Thompson and, uh, and Mr. Broderick. And I got to play a villain, a bad kid. I was, I think I was 18. So that was my first sort of foray into television. But actually, no, before that I was an extra on a show called Doc, which was Barnard, Barney Hughes, Barnard Hughes. Uh, he mm -hmm. was a great theater actor, and they gave mm -hmm. him a sitcom, and I was a, an extra sitting on, uh, a, 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 at the very top of the show. I was always in a, in a room uh, getting examined. Um, that was my job. Um, and uh, nothing, nothing weird happened. But, um, and then I, I actually did a really terrific television movie, which was actually a television event called The Day After, oh, yes. for a brilliant director named Nicholas, K, uh, Nicholas Meyer. Mm -hmm. I had Nicholas Cage on my mind, Nicholas Meyer. Uh, and it was such a big event that afterward, um, I think it was Caspar Weinberger and a bunch of other military and official uh, government, uh, and actually Reagan talked about it, that what would happen if there was a, it was about a nuclear war. What would happen if we did a nuclear war? This event was such a big deal on ABC that afterward they had this sort of disclaimer and try to put everybody at ease. Um, I did Veronica Mars, that played, played a, a pedophile, and um, that was a great job for me. Uh, Rob Thomas called me, goes, you know, you want to play a pedophile? I said, sure. Um, and, um, uh, and I just got done working with uh, the really talented, really great Dwayne Johnson on his show Ballers, where I played another villain. And that's yeah. what's cool about getting older as a, an actor, yeah. is you get to play the villain. Uh -huh. And the villain is a really important part, supporting actor. Best supporting actor. Yeah, it's very important to support the lead, Jimmy Stewart or Gary Cooper or George Clooney, Dwayne Johnson. They're very, f they're fragile. These leads are fragile, and they need to be supported by a wonderful group of actors who support their job. Because being the lead is hard. It's mm. very hard to be the lead. And you need great supporting. So I felt really terrific supporting Dwayne and being as good a villain as I could. And I think that's what's great about getting older. You get to play the villain. The villain's a really important part, you know, so. Well, you have um, a film showing here at Sarasota called Chasing the Blues. Yes. And uh, you 
play a pivotal role uh, as a blabbermouth. Um, pivotal. Pivotal. Um, so I, I wondered about your making that movie, how well, that came about. What was really cool experience, um, they were casting the film and I wanted to play the lead. Uh, I didn't want to play the pivotal role. Um, <laughs> I wanted to play the boring lead. A, because there was more work in it, it was more interesting, and there was more money in it. Um, and I actually flew to Chicago, met the director and the producer, and I kissed their ass from <laughs> dawn till evening. And I did everything they said. I flew in, I said how handsome they were, you know, <laughs> love your shoes, love, you know. I mean, as I said, I was a con man, and that's what we are. We're okay. confidence men. I'm trying to give him the confidence to hire me. Yeah. He said no. And I was really disappointed. I gave it to another great actor, Grant Rosenmeyer, Grant's last name. Another yeah. Jew, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, we're all we all Rosemeyer. mix our names up. We don't care. Yeah. But uh, it's all changed at Ellis Island anyway. So, but then they gave me a two-day gig as the pivotal role, um, and the uh, mouth. And it was and actually it was really terrific. They had to make me look twenty years younger. Okay. So um, there's all, all this new technology that I hadn't been involved in makeup-wise, where they pull your your face back a little bit, and um, I had a wig and special equipment under my chin and everything to make me look very young. So that was really interesting. Um, and then I had a couple of great roles working with Grant, who was a uh -huh. terrific actor. Um, but uh, I didn't have much to do. My friend of mine, John Lovitz, is also in the film. Yeah. And uh, he's a, a wonderful guy and a wonderful actor. You've also directed um, and written. So I wonder how you uh, managed to do that, or is that a direction that you wanted to go into? It's creative, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I, love, uh, I love the arts. Um, Emily and I are fans of the opera or theater. Um, we, uh, uh, we enjoy um, beauty, and mm -hmm. uh, some, of, some of the arts are beautiful. Um, and writing is beautiful. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a, I was just talking to Mark about a, a, a screenwriter's lab that he, he holds here in Nantucket. Yeah. And there's nothing more beautiful than having a blank canvas or a blank page, and you sit down, and the evening or the morning is yours. Anything you want to do, you know, mm -hmm. with a pen and a, a typewriter or a paintbrush, you can go to Mars, you can go to the other world, you can go to Japan, you can go to China, Russia, Brooklyn, you can go anywhere you want with your fingers. And I very much enjoy writing. And I enjoyed directing. I directed a couple of films and a few television shows. And that too is a very interesting, uh, Danny DeVito said a long time ago, and I don't really adhere to this, but he said, why do you want to direct? He goes, because the job of God is taken. <laughs> uh, and in a sense that as, <laughs> a director, you are the guy who's creating the world. Yeah. So. It's kind of but that's an awesome responsibility as well. So, I guess you're up to that job. Yeah, I, I think so. I'm a responsible person. So. What's uh, what are you planning to do next? I'm just gonna have a sandwich after this. <laughs> uh, well, that's very ambitious. I don't know. Is there, what else are we doing? Sandwich? Coke. And I have a Coca-Cola. Coca 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 oh, Coca she wants a Coca-Cola. Well. Um, no, I think, um, what am I doing next? Um, well, I've got a bunch of projects. I've written um, a wonderful script called The Pride of San Quentin, mm -hmm. which is based on a true story about um, the, um, the creation of a new way of, 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 of prison life. In, uh, uh, in 1950, mm -hmm. um, it was uh, 1949, they had corporal punishment, and in 1950, they created a system in the prisons that everybody was gonna be called a new term, rehabilitated. And in 1949, they would, like, Cool Hand, uh, on, on um, what was it, Cool Hand Luke? Where they beat, uh, was Paul Newman's film? Well, actually, yes. the corporal punishment, where they beat the heck out of you, yeah. put you in the hole. 1950, they changed that, and they created rehabilitation. So one of the ways they would rehabilitate was to have a baseball team. 
And the first one created was in San Quentin. And those, those inmates played IBM and Levi's and everybody in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So we wrote a script about that and that's being considered. Um, I'm, uh, I'm working on getting a new agent and that's an interesting subject matter. Um, I, I ha I'm with a small agency and now I'm lobbying to get with one of the big guys, CAA, okay. ICM, and so that's what I'm, I'm looking forward to. Um, and and I, life is a little different for me now. So I'm, I'm working, not working, I'm enjoying my personal life with Emily and my family, and um, I'm having a lot more fun, um, and I would like to work more, um, but at the same time, I'm really enjoying what the business has given me, is the freedom, bless you, to um, enjoy life, yeah. you know? Well, um, I know you've been paying attention to uh, all of the controversy in Hollywood and elsewhere um, in this uh, Me Too era. I was struck um, watching, uh, I'm, I'm going back to Diner again, because there are so many aspects of that film uh, that portray women <coughs> in a very um, retro uh, way. And uh, you know, it struck me that that film could not be made today. Uh, I, because I think the, um, the way the women are portrayed is kind of, um, I, I don't know, it's, uh, it goes back to uh, a culture that uh, we're looking to rewrite, maybe. Uh, you know what, absolutely, you know, um, but that doesn't mean you can't do a film about the Holocaust or slavery. Mm -hmm. we, we, can't, we can't rewrite this. It is how it was, you know? Um, so women were, um, and men, were living a certain life because of the environment that they were in. Want some water? You want some water? You want to, you know, I don't have anything, so if you want. Yeah. <laughs> you might, but um, we, don't, we don't have anything. No, we're good. We're good. Uh, so, but um, uh, you know, my mom, my grandma, grew up in days gone by, and they were treated very well by my grandparents and family. Um, I think that the Me Too movement is very real. Um, but I don't think the past should be erased mm -hmm. and that we shouldn't acknowledge all the good things that were in the past too. Um, you know, there were, there were women that were allowed to fly. Uh, Amelia Earhart mm -hmm. was allowed to fly. Um, there were great women in the past that even though there was, the, the suffragettes were very important. I, I'm actually very glad that the Me Too movement is coming along. Because mm -hmm. now it's time, it's about time that men realize no is no. Mm -hmm. Now most of us men realize no is no. You know, um, Tennessee Williams play A Cat on a Hot Tin Roof had a great character named Brick. Mm -hmm. And when he drank, he said, at one point he'd get a click. Do you, anybody remember that play? And, yeah. You get a click, and that means I'm drunk. That means I've had enough. That's enough. And in the, in the relationship between a man and a woman, when there's a romantic interlude and someone says enough, then most of us men know enough. Mm. You know, and there are some who don't know enough, and they need to, have to be taught. They need to be punished, mm -hmm. not realizing no is no. But I don't think movies about the 60s or 50s or 30s should not be made, mm -hmm. and, women sh and, and, and women and men, I mean, it's not like I'm going to do a movie about Dachau and not have the Jews be tortured. It, it is what it was. Yeah. 
Um, but I am, am wholly in agreement with this movement, and it's about time now. No is no. Mm. And uh, um, I think there's a great deal of, 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 uh, of value every day in, in remembering, and I think it's great for kids, too. So you just realize, you know, I think more kids now, teenagers, will realize no is no, whatever that is. No, I don't want to go out with you. Okay, leave her alone. There's another girl to ask out. So, you know, in a, you know, talking in a, a you know, casual way. Um, you've had such a great body of work, and I know that I haven't touched on uh, most of it. I will. But. <laughs> but. You guys I'm, have a few hours. <laughs> uh, well, I'm thinking that this audience probably um, has some favorites that they want to know more about. That's a very dangerous thing. Because Why is if that? people, because some people, because sometimes you open it up and then nobody asks a question, oh. and then you're, you're like, oh well, now what? Right there, there you go. Zeus and Roxanne. Anybody, one of my favorites. Uh, I don't know if you, may, you might think it was a bomb, but I, I, I think it was a great movie. No, it wasn't a bomb. Actually, it did very well. <laughs> wow. Anybody haven't seen it? Uh, very funny movie. Wow. Thank you for bringing that up. Right, who, who kind of fall in love. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you touched a little bit on that, uh, how it was to, to, um, to sure. work with the uh, animals. Because you had to deal with a dog, you had to deal with a, a dolphin. Yeah, and actually... Uh, you had kids and you had everything. Well, I'll give you an interesting story. The dolphins in that film... The, the story is about uh, me and um, Kathy... Oh, my God. I forgot... I, 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 her name escapes me. She was Academy Award nomination for I Never Promise You at Rose Garden. Um, mm. But, uh, Kathy Quinlan. Quinlan, yeah, yeah, Kathy Quinlan. Um, and uh, she plays a single mom and I play a single dad. Uh, and we're, we, we get together. Um, and I have a, a dog and she has a dolphin. And they two fall in love, which is a beautiful <laughs> little story. But interestingly enough, the dolphins that we used were the same dolphins we used in Cocoon. And I knew them. And it was great. We, we remembered each other. And it was really a terrific experience. You know, they're big animals. And I got in the water with them. And they're really big animals. And you, they're kind of freaky because they're like cows. And they're giant. And they kind of rub up against you. And they, they realize that you're a little nervous, and et cetera. They sort of take advantage of that. Anyway, I had a great experience on that film. Um, Mr. Miller, who directed it, really great director. Um, and uh, I, I, we, we shot in the Bahamas, and we shot a little in Florida. Um, and it was a very meaningful movie to me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, Short Circuit. That was a great movie. Yeah, that was, I lobbied for that very hard. I'm very good at picking out a hit. Now, some people want to hire me and some people don't. But I, when I read a script, I can tell if it's going to be a hit. So I read that, and one of my favorite directors, John Badham, who did War Games and mm -hmm. Saturday Night Fever, mm -hmm. directed it. So I asked my agent to uh, get me in. And uh, it was between, uh, and they wanted Nick Cage for that movie. So um, John Badham agreed to meet me. And uh, I remember I went in for this meeting in Burbank, and I sat there waiting for like an hour and a half to see him. And I walked in there, and I convinced him to give me the job um, over a, another great actor, you know, Nick Cage. And there were like 10 other actors who wanted the part. Um, and I just knew it was going to be great. Uh, the connection between um, inanimate objects and, and, and human beings is always uh, special. You know, men are like that with their cars. You know, uh, <laughs> Bessie, my old tractor, Bessie, or my old Chevy Mustang, or, you know, we, we put, um, this is my buddy, my Stanley Thermos, you know, and I kind of like love him because he carries my coffee or whatever I have, but he's like a friend to me, you know, and, you know, I kind of like, where's my Thermos? You know, where is he? Where's Stanley? Um, so the robot, I had a really interesting time acting with the robot. And it was one of, the, one of the great experiences is working with an inanimate object because mm -hmm. you, can, you can imagine anything you want. 
So I had a wonderful experience on that film, and thank God it was a hit. And there's nothing that gets Hollywood more excited than a hit. You know, like <laughs> a producer will walk by you like you're a mannequin, but if you have a hit, all of a sudden he'll stop and go, hey, hey you, know, <laughs> you know, hey, buddy, hey, man, you know? So. Oh, Single Santa, Oh, Meets the Seeks Mrs. Claus. That was a great film on uh, Hallmark with, um, with a great actress, uh, what was her name? <laughs> she, Crystal, Crystal Bernard. Really great, really, I, I, I can remember everything except the actress is terrible. Um, and um, that was a really sweet movie and actually spawned a sequel. So that was a great, great, great film. Cocoon. Well, that was uh, another movie. Thank you for bringing those up. Yeah. Um, Cocoon was a movie that I, another movie I lobbied for. I read the script and I thought, wow, this is really great. And they didn't want to see me. They were interested in Nick Cage. <laughs> and uh, who, you know, is a brilliant actor. So I, um, <laughs> <laughs> But, it's more important. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but I went in there and I met with, uh, so luckily, Police Academy came out. Actually, I'll give you an interesting story about it. So Cocoon was supposed to be directed by Bob Zemeckis from uh, Back to the Future. Yeah. And uh, Dick Zanuck chose him and they developed a script around him and 20th Century Fox would not make the movie with him because they didn't think he was talented enough. Isn't that interesting? Wow. So Ron Howard just had Splash. So they gave it to Ron. Mm -hmm. And Ron was looking at a bunch of actors, not me. And all of a sudden, uh, Police Academy came out. And all of a sudden, I was a lot better looking. <laughs> and uh, they had me in. And I convinced them to give me the role. Um, and that shoot was, you know, it was magical. You know, I, I was, everybody was in the right place at the right time. And we actually shot right here at, in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Um, and I, everything, you know, they always say, everyone all over the country says, oh, they shot the, the pool scene in my town. You know, everybody says, but it was shot in St. Pete. Um, but it was one of my hits that really did very well for me. And, you know, I got a lot better looking to everybody, which is, you know, a, a good sign. Thank you for bringing it up. How many police academies do we have now? 75. Oh. No, uh, there the, the, are seven. They're due for another. They're due for another. And yeah. I, I've done four, but they did seven. Yeah. Okay. Could, you, could you talk in Cocoon what it was like to work with uh, Jessica, Tandy, and Hugh Crow? Yeah. Mm. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. I owe them a great deal. You know, Emily and I were just talking this morning about networking. I was reading in the Wall Street Journal today that they said going to parties and networking isn't as important as connecting with people you know or reconnecting with people you know. And that's where opportunities will come as opposed to walking around a party and trying to meet somebody. So I was, I've always been very smart about who people are. And Hume was a great screenwriter, you know. Mm. Um, as well as a great actor. And Hume and Jessica were also, of course, theater icons. And of course, Jessica was, you know, was in uh, Glass Menagerie, of course, and Streetcar. Streetcar, yeah. You know, I mean, she was the first Blanche, am I right? Yeah. I mean, the first Blanche. Mm -hmm. So I, I just sucked my lips on there, and I, they would, <laughs> wherever they went, I was right behind them. You know, I just wanted to see how they, walked, how they ate, what they, what they read, what they thought. And I spent a great deal of time with them. And they were, you know, as I said, we're all normal people. Right. They were the same. Yeah. And they were really generous with their time. You know, I'd say, can we have breakfast? Sure. So we'd sit for breakfast. We'd talk about all kinds of stuff, art. They, had, they, they owned an island at one point. They had an incredible art collection. And uh, I constantly said to them, what should I know about being an actor? How do I live as an actor? And they say, well, tell you at the end. 
Mm. So the last day, actually, interestingly enough, Hume, uh, uh, Wilfred Brimley had a fist fight with the first AD, the last day of the movie, and got fired. Because, and, and Wilfred's a great guy, but he just couldn't take this first AD. He was calling to the set too early or whatever. And, and Wilfred has a, and he, Wilfred's a blacksmith, you know, he's a, he's a guy from Utah. Huh. So he, he, I think he, you know, knocked, knocked the first AD out and they, they fired him. So it was a really, it was a really dramatic day. And Hume said, we're gonna tell you the secret now. So I walked into their trailer and they sat me down and they say, here's what you need to know to make a success out of being an actor. <laughs> Is it learn your, know Lear and get ready to do Lear? No. Okay, okay. Uh, study the classics, uh, all of the Gene Kellys, all the uh, Lloyd, uh, Harold Lloyd, all the, which is actually a real picture there. Mm. That's what he actually did. There were, that was not CGI, there was nothing. He actually hung from that, which is amazing. Is it, you know, do my own stunts? No, no. Uh, what is it, what is it? He said, and they both were like this, and we were this close, and I said, Save your money. Oh. <laughs> what? And they both said it at the same time. Save your money. <laughs> That's, it? That's it? Is th is that the advice you'd give a young actor now? I would give a lot of different advice. My first advice would be read. Read. Be smart. Mm. Directors want a smart actor. Directors want actors who know more than them. Mm -hmm. Directors don't want to direct you. They want you to be it and they don't have to worry about you. Mm -hmm. Be smart. Know every Shakespearean sonnet. Read every classic. Know the 100 AFI films. Read Thoreau. Read Shakespeare, read Milton. Know everything you can. So when you come in for an audition, you can say, oh, this monster movie reminds me of, <laughs> you know, Glass Menagerie, you know? <laughs> or this, this character in this, you know, horror film reminds me of Willie Loman. Yeah. And the director will be like, this is the guy. <laughs> so that's my advice all the time. Uh -huh. Be smart and save your money. Because <laughs> what you need to be, when you're not, not when you're 18, but as you get older, mm -hmm. you need to have the ability to say no. And the only thing that gives you the ability to say no is money. Mm -hmm. And if you look at all the great actors who've saved their money, it's about having that ability to live between gigs, to be able to have a constant lifestyle. It doesn't have to be Paris every day, but be able to support your family. That I always say the hardest part of being an actor is my family being around it. It sucks. Mm -hmm. When an actor's out of work, it sucks. When money's yeah. not coming in, it sucks. The actor gets a little down and everybody around him gets a little down. Um, so I, I thought that advice from them, you know, as funny as it is, you know, is, is very true. You know, I, I guess it's, was it the long day's journey into night about the acting family? Uh, the Tyrones. Right, was it, um, I'm trying to think that there was a, a, yeah. a great stage play about an actor and his family and yes. how they, deal with it, you know. O'Neill. Yeah, O'Neill. Yeah. And it's and it's very tough on a family. If you ever talk to all the actors of all time, um, you know, their family goes through this with them because it's you know, it's a it's a it's a gig by gig life. So when you save your money and you don't I always say to actors, don't buy the Mercedes right away. Just drive your Toyota, drive your Honda, put it in the bank, buy those CDs. You know, mm. invest in a little, you know, 
little Apple stock, you know, because, <laughs> you know, especially now, um, because that's what's important. But I, I learned a great deal from Maureen Stapleton, oh, just, oh man, you know, about emoting and about drawing on things that are inside you that no one knows about. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a really great influence on me. Um, and I would, uh, I would walk her home. She, her, we lived in condos. Her condo was right above mine. And I would walk her home because she liked to partake. And um, <laughs> at the end of the day, she needed a little help getting home. So I spent a great deal of time with her too. And we would talk about all the plays and the classics and how important it is to be well read and, and be emotional. It's, it's very important to be emotional. Um, you know, Mel Brooks, one time I was, I was going out for uh, Spaceballs and he hired Bill Pullman, but not me. But he said he was, sorry? But he, was <laughs> said, but he said he was doing a movie and an actor was just posing. And he's like, the guy was really good looking, but he was just posing. There was no emoting. So Maureen Stapleton just said, just emote, you know, let it all mm -hmm. come out, you know. So, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, I suspected you were a mensch, right? But I didn't realize how practical you were. Is that Jewish? Are. I think so. I think, I think but can it we is. Keep, can we, because a lot of people, can we keep Oh, yes, going? absolutely. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't want yeah, to Yeah, no, no, no. I, Oh. You went to the diner. Fells Point? Okay. was one of the guys in the diner. And then a um, uh, best friend of his named Chip. Oh, you're friends with Chip? <laughs> he passed away, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we lost Harold, who was the Kevin Bacon character. Uh, so in a plane crash. Oh. Uh, huh. They maintained their friendships, all of them, correct? Yeah. Because that was a gift that you had to all of us. And his wife was named Debbie? No? Chips? Yeah. Great, great. Yeah, I did um, the bedroom window there. Yeah, yeah, I love Baltimore. That was yeah. a good flick. With where, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> was it Forest Park? Where, where? Right. <coughs> Well, it was, it was financed by MGM, but it was a, a small film. I think an independent is something that is made without a large distribution behind them. So it was actually a, you know, a sort of an afterthought. They gave it to Barry because he wrote Injustice for All. And Jerry Weintraub, who was a very powerful producer, wanted to make the movie, so they, they gave him the money to make it. A um, funny story about when we were making it. People would come up to us on the street. We were right in front of all the row houses, right? And people would say, um, what are you making? So we go, we're doing diner. And they go, never heard of it. We go like, yeah, well, it, it hasn't been made, you know. Uh, 
So they say, well, well who's in it? We go, uh, Kevin Bacon, no. Uh, Mickey Rourke, nah. You know, you know, Barry Levinson directing it, nah. So, you know, people would get constantly upset. You know, like, what, what are you doing here? You know, give us, a, give us something. So we're standing around, someone comes up, and they go, uh, what are you making? So I go, uh, Godfather. <laughs> and they go, Godfather? This is my favorite movie. <laughs> I go, yeah. They go, they go, Which, what scene are you doing? You know, we're doing the scene where Sonny get killed at the toll booth. Oh my God, my favorite scene. <laughs> what, 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 where's De Niro? I go, he's down there. Oh my God. <laughs> This is incredible. I got and, and and James Conn is here. James Conn, Duvall, they're all here. Oh my God! He, guy was thrilled. Walked away satisfied. And, you know, you think to yourself, "What's going on?" But uh, sure. But another thing, you know, you got to give the audience what they want. Right. What was what was your favorite of all your films that you've done? Do you have a favorite one? I do. I do. I do. The next one. <laughs> um, and it is. It's a life of pain because they love you, they hate you, they want you, they don't want you. As unfair as it is when it's bad, that's how unfair it is when it's good. Mm. And it's a terrible paradise. Because there were moments like this where people drive for hours to see you and then there's moments when nobody wants to see you. Nobody wants to talk to you. Um, I still battle it every day and I'm always talking about it, the process of living like an actor. There's a great book that a buddy of mine gave me. Um, about uh, the life of an actor, and the first page is a roller coaster. It's like, that's your life. And uh, I think it's really, you know, really tough. Um, so what you can do is save your money and have good people around you, and then work on your brain. And that's what I'm doing at the age of almost 60 almost coming to a trick of like, my father always says, just be happy. And my mother always says, you don't have to do the business anymore. <laughs> you know, you already won. <laughs> you can take your money and leave. You don't have to do this anymore. Um, I think every actor at one point, as you get older, you go, I don't have to do this anymore. You know, Gene Hackman, one of my idols, mm -hmm. said, I don't want to do this anymore. He just left. I don't know if you've noticed. He just left. Yeah. He's in new. He's in Santa Fe. Santa Fe. He's writing, and he hates the business. Mm -hmm. The business is horrible. Joan and I worked together at a, a, a management firm called Katz Gallen, which w was one of the most powerful management firms in Hollywood. Michael Jackson, Neil Diamond, Dolly Parton. They discovered Will, Woody, uh, Whoopi Goldberg. I remember when Sandy Gallen was my manager said. I'm going to tell you a name, Whoopi Goldberg, and, and I didn't know who that was. Nobody knew who that was. He said, one day she's going to be a household name, and he, and he made that. He, ma he made her. But um, it's incredibly painful, and no actor, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're John Wayne. It's painful. I'll tell you what's really painful is learning to go from the young boy to the ingenue to the middle age, to the older guy. I mean, so many people have a hard time making that transition. Oh, I can't play the young guy anymore. I'm not getting the girl anymore. I'm gonna be the old lawyer, the old father, or the old, but once or you- Or the villain. Hmm? Or the villain. Or the villain, the villain which yeah. is great. <laughs> but it's, it's really a um, conundrum, a, an incredible riddle to be happy, you're always out of work, you know? And, and actors are known to be crazy. I mean, there's not many shoemakers you go, oh, he's crazy, you know? <laughs> you don't mind, that, you know, the guy at the dry cleaning store, oh, he's going through so much, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't happen, you know? Um, but look at all the artists, I mean, Van Gogh cut his 
get a year off. He never saw success. Van Gogh never saw success. Yeah. He was lonely, he was depressed, he was crazy. No one would buy his work. He wrote his brother, life sucks. I mean, that's what the life of an artist is. So you have to be crazy to get into it. But it's so attractive. Oh my God, if I become like Picasso, you know, I'm, everyone's gonna have my paintings. Oh my God, if I become like John Wayne or Cary Grant, oh, what a life. Wake up every day, there are people rubbing your feet and you, know, you wake <laughs> up and you get in there doing your makeup. So in a long-winded way, I always, you know, uh, it's something that I, we think about all the time, that it's, it's a tough life. But if you realize how lucky you are, and I do, that I've been able to give my family and friends and myself opportunities we never would have had, meet people we never would have met, go places we never would have gone, mm -hmm. like here, if I was a shoemaker. <laughs> so I think the key is to, if you're successful or non-successful as an actor, to realize what it is and, and somehow beat it, you know? But you have to beat it every day. So thanks for asking that such a deep question. Sir? Right. Leonard Nimoy, one of the great acting teachers of all time. Bye, nice to see you. I leave too? No. Um, <laughs> but one of the great acting teachers of all time. Uh, really smart, a great artist. Um, Leonard had acting classes um, all the time and uh, was very, very, um, very, very stuck in subtext. And that's a great place to be stuck as an acting teacher and coach. He was a brilliant director and he knew exactly what to do with the three of us guys. I always described him as a fireball inside a glacier because mm. he was mm. very stoic because he was very Russian, grew up with Russian parents, but so warm and loving and gentle and gave me a, a great gift um, by actually one day gave me a little piece of paper and said, just look at this every time you act. And it was subtext, subtext. What is this, you know, you're fighting, you're, you're, you're holding the baby, but what's it really about? So I had a great time with him. I, I spent a lot of time alone with him. I went to his house. Uh, he has a wonderful wife, Susan. Uh, I would have dinner there all the time. The first time I met him, I went to his house and he was very wealthy from Star Trek. And he told me a story. He said, after the this television series of Star Trek, he was broke. He only did two years and he didn't get paid a lot of money. And he would go around the country doing plays. He had a family. It was really, and he was, he too said it was a very painful life. So he was doing Equus on Broadway. And uh, I think he re replaced somebody. So he wasn't getting paid a lot. And Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the president of Paramount, came to him and asked to see him. And he asked his agent, what does this Jeffrey Katzenberg want? He said, he wants to talk to you about Star Trek. He said, no. Tell him, no. I'm not doing Spock anymore. Mm -hmm. Tell him, no. So the agent said, no. Called him back three or four times. Told his agent, if you call me one more time about Star Trek, you're fired. I never want to hear Star Trek again. Why? And I'll tell you why. So this Katzenberg stood at the stage door when he came out one night and grabbed him and said, can I have your autograph? And he said, sure. And he looked down and was, had a little piece of paper and said, I'm Jeffrey Katzenberg. <laughs> and he said, what do you want? And he said, I want you to do Star Trek for Paramount. He was the vice president or something. <laughs> and uh, he said, no. And he said, give me five minutes. Let me talk to you. Okay, come in my car. We'll talk. Sat down and he said, I want you to do Star Trek. We're going to do it a different way. We're going to make Spock the star, blah, blah, blah. He said, I'll tell you why, how, why I hate you guys. Because you merchandised the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. You gave me no money. You made shoes. You made glasses. You made ears. You made T-shirts. <laughs> you made everything. I got zero. You guys owe me millions. I want three times what you owe me. And then I'll consider doing the movie. He went back. They, call, they called Katzenberg the golden retriever. 
because he could get anything. And he got the deal for Leonard. And Leonard got the money from his merchandising, became very wealthy, and then did the, the show. So anyway, I went to Leonard's house, and Leonard's mom was there and made stuffed cabbage. <laughs> and Leonard and I had stuffed cabbage um, the first night we met. And actually, Leonard was the second director. The first director was Colleen Soro, who did the first film in France. But she had a big fight with Jeffrey Katzenberg, who was the head of Disney. Yeah. And she got fired or quit, and then they got Leonard. But he was a great influence on me. Thank you for asking. Well, I, I think uh, we have to close it down, which is very disappointing to me, because I love all these anecdotes. And I Can know we take one more else. question? Uh, one more? Yes. OK, one more. Right here. Lady. Um, oh, oh. First of all, oh. I really like your assessment of your role as an actor. I think it's a really healthy way to look at um, your performance. You know, what you do versus what you do. And it was really nice to see you in the show. And I really appreciate your sharing it. Well, my dad, I, I credit my health to my dad. My dad is a workout nut, always been in great shape, um, was a U.S. Army Ranger, um, and one of the first Jewish Army Rangers. Um, tough as nails, jumped from planes, you know, NYPD. My dad was a really wow. powerful NYPD, great policeman, um, and... Uh, my inspiration in staying in shape. Every once in a while, he'll look at me and go, got to lose a few pounds. <laughs> and I'm like, really? Goes, yeah. um, my dad's very soft-spoken, but really wonderful. And um, psychologically, I, you know, I credit my family being around me and, and working on it all the time, reading biographies of other actors and not buying you know, uh, you know, I, I, I just work on it every day because it mm. can really get you. So I just try to work on it every day. And, you know, and when it's really good, try not to believe it. And when it's really bad, try not to believe it. So. Okay, one more. Mm. Right here. Thank you for being here, Steve. I'll be brief. Thank you. Oh, Lawrence. Lawrence All right, Jayhawk. And Jayhawk. And that movie is so personal for everybody in that town. Yeah. yeah. And I wondered, while you were making that film, did you feel how monumental that was for yes. the town of Lawrence and what it would mean to the country to see this? Yes. Work? It was done so well. The uh, the the, uh, the house, what do they call the uh, brick, the, um, the, the, the the gymnasium? The ha Allen Field House. Well, they... they Allen Fieldhouse, this was a movie about nuclear war and what would happen when the bomb dropped and what would happen. They had like 500 to 1,000 extras almost every day, all in full makeup. Mike uh, mm -hmm. Westmoreland, uh, Westmore was the um, makeup artist in charge. They had probably 20 makeup artists, all doing burns and everything. And um, seeing it every day was an awesome effect. And I started having nightmares every night. And the, night, the mm. nightmare I had every night was, I was on the West Coast, and I heard the bomb dropped in New York. And it was three hours behind, somehow in this nightmare, and the bomb was three hours away of coming to us in the West Coast. And I was at a payphone, trying to call my parents, and I couldn't get through. And it was a nightmare that I had for months during the filming and months afterward. Um, it really had a great effect on everybody because the makeup, when you look at yourself, there was a part where I was affected by all the radiation. My skin was starting to peel off and my hair was gone. Um, and it was a, a terrible, terrible experience um, thinking about what would happen. The direction was brilliant, this guy, Nicholas Meyer, really brilliant director. Um, and uh, I, I found working with the great, 
I had a great experience. I got to work with the great Jason Robards. Mm. The great Jason Robards, who mm -hmm. I would sit in his room and talk to him. He was the actor for O'Neill, the actor, the only actor O'Neill loved. And I, 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 I just was so lucky to sit with him and John Lithgow. So I sat with John Lithgow night after night. Um, I just loved the experience, just loved it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Steve. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming.